It's an absolute privilege to be here on behalf of Skuman Boudre. I hope our narrative will contribute and inspire you in your situation. I am a bit curious. How many people in the audience do have family businesses? Yeah. Family businesses are big contributors to the world's economy. Yet, only 30% survive the second generation. 12% survive the third generation, and only three are operating in the fourth generation. Why would this figure be so low? The inability to adapt and poor succession planning are the main reasons. In 2008, the fourth generation joined Skuman Buderai, but not all of the kids in the generation became active in the business. And suddenly tension arose between those in the business and those not, between households and between the generations. In 2011, we looked for help. With the assistance of Andre Didriks of Fabasa, we started a forum for the family members. We formulated a family constitution, a vision statement, which is a quite mouthful throughout the generations we have been and will remain a blessing to our people, community and country. And we decided what our core values will be. Stewardship, integrity and fairness. The entire family read together the generation to generation life cycles of a family business. In this book, they call the founder of a business the controlling owner. The second ge generation is called the sibling partnership. And the third generation is called the cousin consortium. We also, in this whole process, revisited our roots and we discovered the DNA of Skuman Boudre. And may I say, with gratitude, I want to share a few char characteristics that we inherited and still defines the culture of our business. The founder, Carl Schumann, was an extraordinary man. In 1918, he married Annie Nietlin, a daughter of a wealthy man. Andries had cattle farms in the Marble Hall and Delmas districts. Annie lost siblings in the Anglo-Boer War and a brother due to Spanish flu. Andres asked his son-in-law, Karl, to assist him on his farms, being the only available young man. Skupan accepted the invite since he was number 17 of 18 children, and there was very little left for him. They grew up at Skumansville, where the present Hartwiesburg Dam is. The government was at that stage busy expropriating General um, Hendrik Skuman's land for the building of the Hartebeespoort Dam. So Carl made a choice to leave his family and join his father-in-law. He actually married for ground, for land. In 1919, Andres Nietlin gave the whole enterprise to his son-in-law and he passed away months later. Carl accommodated capable family members in his business, mostly in-laws. In 1920, farming became more than a subsistence matter in South Africa, but farmers were not traders, and they were exploited by wheat and maize millers. To counteract these unfriendly practices, Carl and 19 other farmers of the Dalmas Boerevereniging, which Boerevereniging was referred to earlier. They got together, and this Boerevereniging became the Dalmas Co-op and later the OTK. 
He also founded the National Dairy Corporation, which is now called Clover. This put producers at the table and not to be exploited anymore. In 1925, um, Carl built houses for his workers and he assisted them in cultivating their lands. Everything that is happening has happened before. In 1930, Carl and three other farmers borrowed 34,000 pounds from the Landbank to build the Hereford irrigation system. This 42 kilometer water channel is still a source of life in the Loskop Valley. When the depression struck the world in 1933, South, Africans, uh, so, uh, South African farmers were also hurt and they had to sell land. Carl saw the opportunity and he bought two farms. He also remembered where he grew up, they had tasty grapes. And he sensed the similarity between the Grobers Dal climate and Hartepeerspoor Dam. The Arnapoort in the Old Transvaal was ripe one month earlier than in the Cape. A big window of opportunity. And then he did the unthinkable. He introduced grapes into the summer rainfall region. That earned him the name of the father of deciduous fruit in the Old Transvaal. Today, grapes are still successfully produced in the Loskop Valley, now under hail nets. Carl introduced a logo for his farming enterprise. And since he was a, a Christian, it was from the Bible. But the farm, the, the one border on the farm is the Moses River. And the title act reads, Moses Rafir Mont. So that took Carl back to the 12 spies that came back to Moses after investiga investigating the promised land. They came back with the enormous bunch of grapes. The spies acknowledged the fertile land, but you remember, 10 reported they felt like grasshoppers in the face of the giants living in Canaan. Entering was not possible. Joshua and Caleb believed they must enter Canaan and that they will overcome the giants because God keeps his promises. In 1938, the logo was registered and you will recognize it as the same as Israel's tourism emblem. So when, when Carl came up to the um, Heraldische Vereniging, they said, this is taken. And what he did, he said, but this people are going to walk to the other side. So we changed <laughs> their way of walking. <laughs> After the Depression in, and the Second World War, mechanization excelled worldwide. And Carl imported hydraulically powered irrigation pumps from England to extract the water from the Elephants River. He also ordered a bulldozer from England to, to improve the roads where he was uh, operating. He started a practice still in use called Accord Agreement, it would be in English, under a cam camel thorn tree at a white cloth table he would sit down and have a discussion with every employee on the work done the past season, the credit was given, dreams were discussed, and the salary was agreed on. Carl's wife, Annie, was a hard-working, well-educated, interesting woman. She read the Bible and the books of Dutch theologians. She ran a Sunday school for all the children on the farm and dared a new recipe every Sunday from the Landbouwerkplatz. In 1946, Karl started a partnership with his two sons, Andries and Hendrik. They adopted a slogan that is still in use, as good as the best, better than most. In 1950, Karl and his youngest son, Hendrik, visited the United States of America 
This was unheard of for farmers in that time. On their itinerary was an agricultural show in Iowa, and it was an eye-opener and a big stimulation. Two years later, Hendrik made use of his contacts overseas, and he sent soil samples to the USA for analysis, since it wasn't possible in South Africa. The neighbors and the brother thought this a big waste of money. The partnership between the two brothers lasted only for seven years. A son of Andres said, in every possibility, my father saw a problem, and in every problem, Wim Hendrik saw a possibility. Don't waste a good crisis. Carl realized his two sons will not be a team, and he divided his enterprise and made sure the split was fair. A sibling partnership died. When Carl was 60 years old, he resigned from his enterprise and became a founder member of Foscor and the Bantu Beleggingskorporasi, which he chaired for several years. He was involved in schools, missionary work, hospitals, and agriculture. Carl was indeed a pioneer, and what a legacy. Skuman Budre changed hands to the second generation successfully but not to a sibling partnership, but to a controlling owner again. Back at the farm, Henrik, the new owner, realized the black people, by far the majority of consumers, prefer oranges to grapes. Inspired by Isidore Schlesinger of Zibedila, he introduced oranges and narches to Musrafir and the Loskop Valley. He built many dams and flood irrigated the orchards, but there was a lot of water waste. So we planted vegetables between the orchards to optimize the water usage and his cash flow. Hendrik was an ambitious daredevil. He doubled his inherited land and he managed between 20 and 25 enterprises. Exporting fruit grew and was an excellent income. So he built his own pack house for oranges while other farmers used the co-op. He differentiated himself from poor producers. In 1960, the Netherlands started to boycott South Africa. And in the 80s, boycotts were severe. Plans had to be made and you cannot believe how much South African produce was exported through Maputo. In 1966, 41 years of age, Hendrik entered politics. In 1970, he became the Minister of Agriculture, a, a position he held for 15 years, and then he became the Minister of Transport for six years. During this time, he had to manage his business at arm's length, not always very effective. Ver van jou goed, na by jou skade, het my moeder gesê. Christel, his wife, managed the household and was the perfect host for many a guest. She was her husband's strength. Hendrik had a sense of humor that converted enemies to friends. He despised pride and haughtiness and often said, Hoe hoer a Bobby Jaant in a paal opklim, hoe meer sien jy van sy achterend. <laughs> Accolades wasn't done in this family. He often reminded us, when the ever-present giants emerge as droughts, hail, low prices, boycotts, never see a glass half empty. It is half full. If Carl was the pioneer, Hendrik can be called the expansionist. Skuban Boudere changed hands for the next generation. Again, not a sibling partnership at that time, but a controlling owner for the third time. Kali took over the reins in 1978. He also inherited a big debt 
of about 3 million rand. Today it would account for something between 150 and 180 million rands. The business was cash strapped and overborrowed. Immediate action was necessary, and Kali started measuring the cost and profit of every enterprise. He sought advice from Professor Eckhart Kassir. Kassir told him, you are running a fruit salad, fruit salad business boy, and you need to cut everything that doesn't contribute at least 10% of the turnover. The historical grapes had to go, the vegetables, the potatoes, the dairy, the cotton, the tobacco, the wheat, the avos, the pecans. And specializing became the name of the game, with attention to better irrigation. The business outgrew the flat management structure completely. The first management book was our MC's father's book, Help a Kisaplas Bestieder by Arnold Moll. Drucker and Maxwell's books also became helpful agents on Kali's desk. He appointed more skilled people. I want to say this one of Clem Santi. If you constantly appoint people smaller than yourself, you will become a company of dwarfs. In four years, Skuman Budrai was out of the red. Hard work and passion helped the business to kill the big giant, but a lesson was learned. Kali has a system model, who is a co-inheritor of the business. In, in 1983, Kali invited her husband, Kubis Furi, to join the business. Kubis concentrated on the admin and finances. A hybrid of a sibling partnership was born. Kubis introduced computers, financial systems, and stock control, and he served as our FD for many years. His successor for the last year now is Dirk Wolfart, I believe, from this vicinity. In the 80s, Anton Rupert's advice was highly regarded in South Africa, and he said, on the honor, push and consolidate, push and consolidate. And that is what Kali did. He consolidated the business. In 1991, he was awarded the National Farmer of the Year Award. This was a big reward and an honor and motivation. On the 29th of April, 1994, a new dawn broke for our country and South Africa could step back onto the international stage, not through Maputo. Commodities were deregulated, and all the boards from the previous government, like the maize board and the meat board and the pisangrat and the citrus board, closed down. Farmers were on their own now, and responsible for finding markets and selling their own fruit overseas. Maize could only be sold through suffix. Many farmers could not adapt and sold their land. Overhead costs rose, and a feasible farm was now at least 1,000 hectares in size. You had to become bigger or better, else you were out. A number of farmers, the number of farmers in South Africa shrank from about 80,000 to 25,000 today. In 2006, the euphoria of the Rainbow Nation became a bit bleak and gray. Also at Skuman Buderay. While Kali and Kubis were growing older, none of the next generation were interested in joining the business. This was a new giant we didn't know. In 2008, the miracle happened, and our son, Hendrik, and the oldest son-in-law of Govis and Marl, Brent Parrott, joined the business. And this is where I started 10 minutes ago. The cousin consortium began. 
We are still in a hybrid phase because the elders are still very much there. Kali is still the MD, but the reins are in the hands of the fourth generation. In 2013, another son-in-law, Jacques Ruiz, joined the business, and the third son-in-law, John Jones, acts as, a, as an advisory, in an advisory capacity. The Cousin Consortium uses the family forum, the family constitution. Now a healthy communication is possible and mistrust disappear. Emphasis is now on the team and not the individual. And they are amazing. They drone, they Skype and Zoom and analyze. <laughs> and they are constantly adapting to a specialized, specialized farming world. They are not sentimental. They don't mount a dead horse. They see the big picture and they sit at the international tables planning the menu. They build good relationships and they invest in all our people. Salaries are on par. All employees' health are taken care of. Management development is a priority. Skills development is a big focus. Key performance indicators are identified. 360 degree evaluations are done and the feedback is to the better, to better the people. They intentionally build our culture because they know culture eats strategy for breakfast. They borrow money to buy land for water. They take risks and they do make mistakes. But they don't waste a good crisis. It is regarded as school fees. And you all know a good school is not for free. They buy when others want to sell and they sell what people want to buy like lemon golds. They are seldom in the box and they do joint ventures. They enhance technology. They face the giants, which include corruption, the weak rand, unreliable power, land caps, the forever changing coal posts for BE, expropriation without compensation, a dysfunctional government, and mines destroying excellent farming soil. Hendrik insisted that there must be a budget for the vision. And he started a development program with Marna de Lange of ITC, Umsisi. We help people, we coach people to plant vegetables. And then we coach them a balanced diet by the food robot. And they can earn an extra income. The gardens are close to where they live and now they are more healthy. On our farm, in the last three years, we call this uh, broad-based livelihoods, BBL gardens. 186 households can provide for themselves. 90 house, house, households are selling to their neighbors or they bought a beetroot for spinach. 35 ha households are selling to traders. But this is now also going out to the communities. On the next slide, oopsie, did I say the next one? Yes, if you can see the red dots, that's vegetable gardens. You can see Moosafir in, in a range of 100, uh, 120 kilometers uh, radius around the farm. There are now 22 villages involved in this vegetable gardens. 640 families participate. And 140 families have built their own vegetable tunnels. We give them the once-off tools, which is a, a drip irrigation and a bucket. And it's um, developed by Chris Timmy. Easy, you don't need a tap. You can use your grey water. But the beautiful thing is, they also realized how costly water is. And in that right picture, on the, uh, you can see how they gather water in bottles. We don't bring them to the classroom. We take the knowledge to them where they live. 
And if they can introduce two people successfully into BBL, they receive a tunnel. And a tunnel triples the yield of their vegetables. This is such a success story and such a wonderful way to see not only people working for us, but all the uh, vicinities and communities around us. And they are always full of praise for the better living they, are, they have. Jacques also started an empowerment arm, Zamukele. We adopt a farmer and we teach them to sustainably produce dry beans. We assist them in the cultivating, cultivating in the harvesting and in the marketing of dry beans. And I think we have about 29 people, uh, farmers, upcoming farmers participating in this program. We also have partners in this, uh, Grain South Africa, Tiger Brands, Rhodes, Agron, the Dry Bean Producers Organization, and Hello, I Am Your Mentor. We are really trying to be a blessing to our communities and our countries. As good as the best and better than most was a big pain to Hendrik, my son. And he told Kali, how can you say that if you never measure? Now it's merely, not merely a slogan anymore. It is measured internationally and now we know where we fall short. Kali identified three pillars of concern that need to be balanced. People, planet, and profit. If one is neglected, the business will be in trouble, and our vision will be empty words against a wall. In, pre in preparing this pre presentation, I was amazed to see these th three pillars have actually been present for a hundred years. I was so thankful to realize how God provided the right man at the right time. The pioneer, the expansionist, the consolidator, and now a young team. They are building our people, our planet, and our profit. A solid foundation was laid for generations to come. May they stick to the culture that proved to be sound in this beautiful, giant loaded country of ours. And may they keep on painting outside the lines. I would like to congratulate Francois van Niekerk for his wise investment in people with this conference. This is indeed good company. Thank you.